This hasn't tortured me since my childhood or anything. <laughs> All right, uh, great. So uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit. This probably will be a, a kind of a quick talk. But uh, what I want to talk to you a little bit about today is how to, how to hack your Jupyter Notebooks with customized plugins. Um, and in a, a truly terrible pun whose meaning will become clear later in my talk, um, I'm going to tell you about a, a Jupyter plug -in. I wish I could take credit for that. Someone else on our team uh, pointed it out to me. So, uh, but first, I want to tell you just a little bit uh, about Civis as a company, um, how we use Jupyter Notebooks, and kind of how we came towards um, wanting to write a plugin for notebooks in the first place. And then I'll, I'll walk you through the plugin that we created. And then so that you, know, you can walk away from this talk with some useful information, uh, I basically made a, a, a dummy plugin, posted it on GitHub, and I'll walk you through the code for it. And you could you know, go away from this talk with sort of a template that says, all right, I, I'd like to make a plugin of my own. Where's a really easy place for me to start with, with some code that I can just sort of swap in the things I care about? And, and that'll be sort of the second part of the talk. Um, but first, let me just tell you a little bit about, about Civis as a company. So, um, as a company, Civis traces its origins to the, the 2012 Obama re-election campaign. Um, a bunch of our staff here uh, worked on the, the analytics team for the, for the re-election effort in Chicago. So statisticians, computer scientists, data scientists, you know, really technical folks who were uh, doing things like collecting survey data, building predictive models at the individual level, uh, forecasting election results, running randomized controlled experiments, all that really interesting stuff um, that we think about when it comes to data science and analytics. Um, and since the campaign, Civis has formed to basically um, take a lot of those same techniques around doing individual level data science and um, extending the work out to companies, nonprofits, other political campaigns, um, that sort of work. So um, basically, as a company, we do two, two separate things. So we do data science consulting, um, so sort of, well, not traditional consulting, but um, data science consulting projects around predictive modeling and data science software. Um, and then we also uh, produce software products of our own that we sort of sell as off-the-shelf products. Um, so on the consulting side and in our data science team, we use notebooks super heavily um, for all the, the reasons that, that Brian talked about this morning. Um, you know, the flexibility, um, the documentation, just, just how they codify the way that data scientists really, really work. Um, but like I mentioned, we also uh, have off-the-shelf off software products that we sell to st that started as our internal tools for doing a lot of this consulting work. Uh, but that we now sell to clients as standalone software products. So um, basically, we have a data science platform that sits on top of Amazon Web Services and does a lot of things for clients to help them do things that we would do for them in a consulting capacity. So basically, um, really nice wrappers around Amazon Redshift that allow you to sort of unify all your data in one place, uh, do automated uh, reporting, query your data, um, enhance it by matching it to consumer file data and other sources of data and then build predictive models in kind of a really simple, easy, intuitive way. Uh, and then we also have support for, for running your own R and Python code within the platform as part of other, other workflows. Um, but as data scientists here, we use notebooks super heavily for a lot of our work, but we don't have sort of first class notebook support in our platform. The question was like, is there something we can do to sort of bridge this world where we work in notebooks really heavily, uh, but our platform runs R and Python code sort of in a different way? And so spent some time kind of just hacking together something on the weekend, the result of which, I guess it's actually a little hard to see, is this button um, inside of a notebook, which is actually the, the Civis logo. And so let me, let me show you what actually happens when you click this button. So I don't do demos, so this is kind of a recorded GIF. So if you click that button, it's going to pop up uh, a modal window, and it asks you kind of one, of one of three things that you'd like to do with your notebook. And that first button says, I want to take the HTML output of my notebook, and I want to upload it into this data science platform where this is something that I can now um, share the rendered output with other members of my data science team in kind of a really nice permissioned way. So it's gone through the notebook. The extension's go, uh, the plugin's gone through the notebook. It's rendered it. It's grabbed all the HTML. And then it's posted it to this API endpoint that we have for our platform. Uh, the next button that we're going to click here um, shows almost the same thing, where what if I don't want to share the fully rendered output of a notebook? I want to just take a single graph output from a single cell and do the same thing, post it to an API endpoint and share it. Um, and then finally, the last thing it will do is um, that middle button. It will go through the notebook, figure out what kind of kernel you're running, whether you're running Python or R, go through the cells and figure out which ones are code cells, grab the code, and then post them to a different endpoint. That endpoint accepts Python code, 
and then we'll, you can schedule your, your Python code to run inside of a Docker container on a schedule and, and all this sort of stuff. And now I flipped over here to show the same thing. Uh, this is a notebook now running the R kernel, just to show that it's, it's recognizing that you're running the R kernel, it's grabbing the R code, and it's posting it to a different endpoint that knows this is R code and, and lives within the platform. So this is really cool. Um, it gave us kind of a way to, um, to integrate the notebooks that we know and love with some of these other features of our, our data science platform. Um, but because the, that API, API is not open, it's only available to our clients, um, and I, we can't really open source the code right now, I wanted to just take the essence of that plugin, uh, translate it to something perhaps a little bit more important, uh, uh, an extension to insert pug photos into your notebook, and then walk you through like, how you actually build one of these if you wanted to, to do so. Um, so if you're interested, I put the code up on my own personal GitHub. The extension is called Pug Me Jupyter, um, and it's really simple. It's 125 lines of JavaScript code, uh, which will give you that little pug button inside of your notebook. Um, so I should say, actually, now uh, at the outset, I'm not a JavaScript expert or a JavaScript developer. So my background and expertise is more machine learning, traditional Python code, R code, uh, not really anything involving the front end. Um, so I'm assuming there are at least some of you from that background. So for the JavaScript experts, um, I don't know, excuse my ignorance or naivete about the explanations of JavaScript I'm about to give. Anyway, so, so what is this 125 lines of code? How does it actually give you um, a plugin that you can do something with in your notebook? Oh no, sorry. First, let me actually show you what it does. So similarly, it's gonna pop up uh, that modal and give you three different options of, of what kind of pug you would like to insert in your notebook. So the first uh, is Boris the pug, who is my pug. One thing my, my team knows about me, uh, but you guys might not know is that I have a small obsession with, with pugs. Uh, so so that's, the first is a, a photo of my pug. Um, but if you, if you don't like my pug, you can insert a photo of Doug the pug, who is an internet celebrity, uh, with a middle button. And then the third button, uh, which is my favorite, will actually go out and get a, a random photo of a pug uh, from Reddit. So I guess you know, you, it will grab uh, the, the 25 most recent posts from the, the PIX subreddit that have pug in it. Uh, look for the ones that have an imager link, and then it sticks that inside of the notebook. So how is something this amazing possible, you might be wondering. Um, so let's, let's walk through um, kind of some of this code and how it works. So basically, um, an extension for the notebook is, is basically a JavaScript module. Um, everything is just wrapped in this module definition. Um, and the module definition specifies some dependencies and then a function to run once those dependencies have run. Um, so here, defining three dependencies, there's this namespace dependency, which gives you access to the IPython, uh, all the IPython notebook sort of stuff. Um, there's, there's this dialog dependency that is what allows you to pop up that modal dialog. Um, and then we're going to use jQuery. So that's sort of the, the definition. And then at the very, very end, after a bunch of stuff, what you return is the function that should run when the plugin actually loads. So um, this object here, uh, load IPython extension, and then the function to load when the plugin has loaded. So then somewhere in this dot, dot, dot is that function specification of what it's gonna do and then all the other stuff. So what is the, what, what do we do when the, the plugin loads? So we do a couple of things. We uh, register an action, which again is just another function, and then we add the button and tell the button to call that action when it is clicked. That's what these three lines are down here. So then what, what, is, what is the action? What happens when we actually click on the button? Uh, and here, it's, it's maybe a little bit hard to see on the screen, but you could grab this from GitHub if you're interested. Um, so the action I'm defining here uh, does a couple of things. So um, first we specify uh, an icon for the button. Um, and what you specify here is the name of a font awesome icon type. I'm gonna say more about icons in a second. Um, and then there's some, some text for the button and then the, the specification of the modal that we're gonna pop up. Um, so in the modal, we add three different buttons. You could add whatever buttons you want. Um, with some bootstrap styling, and then the, f the functions that get called when the button is actually clicked. So here we're defining three functions, insert Boris, insert Doug, or insert random. And then in that specification, uh, for each one of those functions, we're calling the same underlying function, insert pug, just with three different arguments. Um, oh, actually, I should have stepped through this. Right, so 
specify the icon, specify the modal window, and then the actual actions that you take when a button is clicked. Um, so let me take a short digression on buttons. So um, from what I could find in all the plugin documentation, what you're supposed to put for a button icon is the name of a Font Awesome icon. So Font Awesome is this project that has kind of like a library of a bunch of different um, icon types, and it's got a ton of cool stuff. I mean, there's like a little mug of beer icon, battery icons, like a whole giant library of icons. But what if you actually want to put your company's logo or an animated GIF of a pug wagging its tail, for instance, just hypothetically speaking. Um, so I was actually kind of happy that I came up with this sort of hack. I don't know, maybe there's a real legitimate way to do it, but I couldn't figure out the legitimate way to do it. So basically what I've done is that um, you name the icon a type that doesn't exist in Font Awesome, and then in your onload function, you use jQuery to, to replace that with an image from the internet. So um, in the onload function, I do a couple things to check like, hey, is my notebook actually connected to the internet? If it's connected to the internet, uh, select the thing that has that name and replace it with an image that gets loaded from the internet. And if you're not connected to the internet, just replace it with some text. Um, and that was pretty cool. It actually was what allowed me to, to make this thing that has you know, the Civis icon in the button, or it's a little bit hard to see here, but that, that tail is actually wagging on that pug icon, which really is crucial to the effect, I think. Um, OK, so that's a digression on buttons. And then what are we actually doing um, in some of these functions? So um, we're doing a couple things. Basically, one helper function is just grabbing the URL that we're interested in. So uh, you know, fixed URL for my dog's photo or for Doug the Pug's photo. Or for a random photo, just making an Ajax call to some Reddit endpoint and then doing some munging to figure out, like, is this, the actual, is this an actual image or link? And then doing some replacement to get the JPEG. Um, and then once we have the URL, this is sort of where the notebook interaction piece uh, comes in. So um, we grab the selected cell of the notebook uh, with this line here. And then what we're doing is inserting some text into the cell and changing that cell to a markdown type and then executing the cell. So basically what I've done is just inserted an image tag with a URL in a markdown type. And it's like you know hitting shift enter or whatever, force it to execute and then the, the image pops up. Um, so a non-exhaustive list of things you can do with an extension. So you can add or delete cells to the notebook. Um, so this, this, this extension I just showed you know, adds a cell. You can grab or change cell types, you know, make the cell markdown, make it code. You can grab or change the contents of the cell. So in the pug example, I'm inserting contents into a cell. In the Civis API example, I'm, I'm grabbing the contents of the cell, you know, checking if it's a code cell, grabbing the actual thing that the user has put in there, and then sending it out to an API. You can grab the results of a cell that you've executed, like um, grabbing the HTML output of that rendered graph I showed at the beginning. Um, you can execute cells. You can access the kernel to know if it's R or Python or Julia or whatever you're running. Um, the first example I showed, you can run NB convert behind the scenes to render like the full HTML of the notebook. Uh, and then obviously you can grab and push things to and from web APIs just with um, jQuery Ajax calls. Um, and then I didn't show an example of this, but um, you can store things in the configuration of the notebook uh, itself. So uh, the Civis example, we store API keys in the configuration. And then when the, so the user sets that up at the very beginning and then when they click the button, you grab their API key from the configuration and use it for the API calls that you make. Um, so one of the things that I found while trying to write this extension for the first time is that um, there's not a whole lot of documentation around this in the, the whole Jupyter IPython ecosystem. I had to sort of look in a lot of different places, look at a lot of source code, look at some examples, and really just like hack something together that worked. Um, so here are a couple resources I thought were useful. Um, so there, here's the, the source code, like I said, for the, the pug example I just showed. Um, if you really wanted to just do something simple, you should just be able to take that and rip out um, some of the guts of it and replace it with your own actions and icons. Um, the repo has, uh, has instructions for how to actually install the, uh, the plugin. I didn't mention that. But um, there's, a, there's an extension installation subcommand to Jupyter that actually installs them. Um, and then a couple of tutorials and docs that I did find that have um, some documentation about this. But then to actually figure out like some of the actions you can do on the cells, 
uh, really the best place was to look in the JavaScript source code in the main Jupyter project itself. Um, so my impression is that this stuff is um, kind of just sort of emerging and just changing. So um, there aren't a lot of really great places to read about it. Uh, and so finally, I, I need to show this because last night when I was finishing my talk, I ran the extension and it pulled up this random photo. And I thought, um, you know, today was just such a perfect day to show a photo of a pug that has the same exact facial expression as uh, Donald Trump. All right, so that's it. Uh, thanks.